Mr. President, I want to give kind of an update here as to where we are on the status of our broad bipartisan energy bill. Last week, we, we started out a little rough because of the, the blizzard, the snow days. Um, but once we began the debate, we heard some very strong statements in support of our Energy Policy Modernization Act. We heard it from members on both sides of the aisle, and that was very encouraging. We heard members tout provisions that relate to supply, to innovation, to efficiency, just the whole gamut. And we began an open amendment process, as we promised, that has already drawn close to 200 proposals now. Last week, we accepted 11 amendments. We had three roll call votes, and we had eight voice votes. Those amendments, I think it's important to recognize, were sponsored by 10 different senators. They were co-sponsored by many, many others, and they really add to, to the members that um, we've seen their priorities incorporated in the energy bill through the process that we had in committee. So the, the benefit of, of, of really getting back to regular order where you have good, strong, robust committee work and then being able to come to the floor, go through the, the amendment process, and then gain input from other members it's kind of good old-fashioned governing, and I kind of like the fact that we are back to it. We agreed to boost our efforts to develop advanced nuclear energy technologies. This came to us uh, by way of an amendment from a very diverse group. Uh, some might not have uh, anticipated the, the collection of senators that this advanced nuclear energy technology measure brought together, but it was the two senators from Idaho, Rish and Crapo. We had Senator Booker. We had uh, both senators from Illinois, uh, Kirk and Durbin, as well as Senator Hatch and Senator Whitehouse. So really, all, all different perspectives in terms of uh, political perspectives as well as geographic. We also agreed to a proposal from Senator Daines and Senator Tester that will help facilitate the use of clean, renewable hydropower in their state of Montana. Uh, among others, we agreed to an amendment from Senator Capito and Senator Manchin to study the feasibility of an ethane storage and distribution hub here in this country. I think that's a real possibility as, as a result of the shale gas revolution. So we moved through 11. 11 is a good number. Uh, but Honestly, I had hoped that we would have been able to process more amendments last week. So what we're going to do this week, and I'm just putting everybody on notice, we're going to redouble our efforts. I want to, to move forward and process even more over these next couple days. Our staffs have been extraordinarily busy over this weekend, as have I and as uh, Senator Cantwell, my ranking member, kind of going through all of the amendments that have been offered to the bill, determining which ones we can clear, which ones uh, we need to bring up for a vote, which may, may not be offered at all. And we are moving right along, and that's good. And we need to keep moving right along because we know that time on the floor is not unlimited. Where we, as important as the energy bill is and as important as modernizing our energy policies are, we're not the only show in town here. There are other members, there are other committees that either are on deck or want to be on deck waiting for their turn to move their, advance, their bills. So if we have any members that are still thinking about filing amendments, I would strongly encourage that that be done today. We've got dozens uh, of, of options to vote on, so at this point, uh, unfiled amendments are really at, at a disadvantage, just given all that we're dealing with. Know that we're going to process as many amendments as possible, but the window for, for uh, really advancing them is, is, is closing rapidly. Many of the amendments we're seeing would address opportunities for challenges, opportunities and challenges from across the energy spectrum, and, and I, I, I really am thankful for the senators that have come forward with very, very constructive suggestions, and, and really for their work to make this bill even better. And as we resume consideration of this legislation today, I also want to explain 
how the provisions that are already within the Energy Policy Modernization Act will help our country. And I want to do that today, spend a few minutes uh, this afternoon, by explaining how it will benefit my home state of Alaska, how it will help Alaskans produce more energy and more minerals, how it will help Alaskans pay less for their energy, and how it will boost Alaska's economy at a time when we really need a boost. The most obvious place to start is with supply. Alaska, as, as all my colleagues know, is a producer for the rest of the country, really for the rest of the world. That's our legacy. It's also our future. And, and that's because we're blessed with an amazing abundance of resources that most states, and, and really even most countries, can't even, can't even dream of. You name the resource, and there's a pretty good chance that we have it. And in fact, there's a pretty good chance that we have a lot of it. So how will our bill help Alaska produce more energy and minerals? For starters, it boosts hydropower development. Hydropower right now provides 24% of our state's electricity, which is good, critically important. But we have more than 200 promising sites with untapped hydropower potential. So our commitment to this clean, renewable resource and our efforts to improve the regulatory process for it could benefit communities throughout the southeastern part of the state where I grew up, south central, uh, where I'm living now, the southwest. It, it provides benefit for all. Our bill also streamlines the approval process for LNG exports. The presiding officer knows full well the benefit that this will bring to the country. But it also will ensure that in Alaska, our efforts to market its stranded natural gas can proceed in a timely manner without federal delay, which is very important for us as we move forward our efforts to move Alaska's natural gas. It will also help Alaskans harness more of our geothermal potential. We have enormous quantities of, of, of geothermal, but uh, we, we, have, we have some challenges, as you know, with our extensive geography, but looking to develop a renewable resource that could potentially, potentially help power one quarter of our state's communities, particularly in some very remote, high-cost energy states. Our bill reauthorizes a program to advance the development of electricity from ocean and river currents, as well as tides and waves. I've mentioned before, we've got some 33,000 miles of coastline. That's a lot of area to harness the power of the tides, the, the, the waves, um, but then our river systems are extensive also. So working to do more with our marine hydrokinetic and our ocean energy could really provide a boost to projects that are showcasing some new technologies like those that we have uh, proposed in Igiagak. Uh, Yakutat is looking at a project, a project south of Kenai along the Yukon River. We also, within the bill, promote the production of heat and electricity from the tremendous biomass resources within our forests, which could help the development of technology to aid the construction of, of wood pellet plants across the state. Again, taking that resource that is there and helping to reduce our energy costs. It will also renew a research program to develop Alaska's immense resources of frozen methane hydrates. This is something that they sometimes call fire ice. It has significant promise as a secure long-term source of American energy. But making sure that we're able to move out on that research is going to be important. And then there's a subtitle on, on minerals, a very important part of our bill. I, I spoke on this on Thursday, that we have incorporated um, much of the text of my American Mineral Security Act, which is designed to focus on our nation's deepening dependence on foreign minerals and the concern that we don't want to get in the same place with our minerals that we, that we once saw with oil, where we are reliant on foreign sources to supply the things that we need. We are 
obviously known in Alaska for our oil production, but Alaska also has nearly unparalleled potential for mineral production. We had a, a hearing um, last year before the Energy and Natural Resources Committee, and we had the Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Natural Resources, Ed Fogel, come and testify. And he said that if Alaska were a country, we would be in the top 10 in the world for coal, copper, lead, gold, zinc, cop uh, and then silver. And he also noted that we have the potential to produce many of the minerals that we import from abroad. Just one example. Our state government has already identified over 70 deposits of rare earth elements just within the borders of the state. And as I mentioned last week on the floor, we use, we use rare earths for everything from renewable energy technologies and smartphones to defense applications. But right now, this country, we are not producing any of that supply, none of that supply on our own. And yet, we have the potential up north. If we pass this bill, our nation will begin to place a much greater priority on resource assessments so that we can really understand what is it that we have. If we haven't done an inventory, if we haven't done an assessment, how do we really know the extent of our mineral resources? We'll finally make some common sense reforms to improve our notoriously slow federal permitting system, which could really benefit some of the projects that we have that we'd like to get moving on. We've got a, a project down on Prince of Wales Island called Bokan Mountain that has uh, rare earth potential. Uh, we also have a, a graphite deposit uh, near Nome and, and making sure that we are able to help facilitate some of the changes that, that we see within this bill will be important. As we produce more of our natural resources, Alaskans will benefit significantly. We'll see new jobs created, new revenues will be generated for our state's treasury, and local energy costs, which is this next area that I want to focus on, will decline, allowing Alaskans to keep more of their money for other purposes and needs. This is, this is an issue where when I am at home and I'm talking to Alaskans about what their number one concerns and priorities are, I don't care what part of the state I'm talking to folks in, it's all about the high energy costs. What can we do to make a difference? What can we do to bring down our energy costs? So the Energy Policy Modernization Act will not only boost our energy supplies, be it, you know, this is a supply bill, but it's also designed to help lower the cost of energy and to help lower the cost of energy for Alaskans. We are an energy and a mineral producer in the state, but due to our, our vast geography, energy is still extremely expensive in so many parts of, of the state. It's always an eye popper for people to, to do a, a comparison of what's going on with energy costs. Right now in the lower 48, people are enjoying uh, going to the, the filling station and, and seeing prices that are less than two bucks a gallon. I was in Nome, Alaska just a few weeks ago and, and they're paying over five and a half dollars a gallon at, at the pump. And um, it's, it's not unusual that in many of our communities around the state, we're still, we're still looking at five dollars a gallon for for your for your fuel, and this is this is not only fuel for your vehicles or your snow machine or your four wheeler to move you around, or for your boat. Uh, it's also your your stove oil, how you're keeping warm. So it's it's moving around, it's keeping warm, and you're paying extraordinarily high costs. Our electricity costs are in many cases two to three times higher than in most other states. Um, and, and when you think about what, what that means, when you're, a com when you're living in a community where effectively 40 to 50 percent of your, your household budget goes to stay warm and to keep the lights on, what does that leave you with for, for educating your kids, for feeding your kids, for, um, for retirement? It doesn't leave you with much when you're spending half of what you have coming in to stay warm and to keep your lights on. So 
This is, this is part of our reality in Alaska that every day we work to address. Every day we work to make a difference. State Senator Lyman Hoffman is from the Bethel region, um, and he's really been a voice uh, of rural Alaska. And he sent me a letter about this issue last year, and he wrote that, quote, the high cost of diesel and home heating fuels are just crushing in rural Alaska and that he believes the energy situation is the single most important problem facing the lives and well-being of rural Alaskans. And I agree with him. I agree with him, Mr. President. And that's why we've worked so hard within this Energy Policy Modernization Act to make sure that as we are modernize our, modernizing our energy policies, we're working to do everything that we can to lower the costs of energy for Americans and for Alaskans. We reauthorize the Weatherization Assistance Program, which provides our state with funding to improve the energy efficiency for low-income families' homes. We also renew the State Energy Program, which allows Alaska to invest in energy efficiency, renewable energy, emergency preparedness, and other pr priorities. We have as you've seen and we've heard talked about on the floor, we've got an entire, entire title of the bill, uh, Senator Portman, Senator Shaheen have been working on this, devoted to efficiency. From everything from voluntary building code improvements to the retrofitting of, of schools. And as our vehicles, our appliances, our homes are all becoming more energy efficient, if energy efficient that in turn works to reduce energy consumption as well as energy costs throughout the state. The bill also has a provision to promote the development of hybrid microgrid systems. This is, this is a part of the bill that I get excited about because I can see the direct application in my state. It allows communities to utilize local resources and storage technologies. Microgrids are really critical within the state of Alaska. We've got, we've got dozens, we've got more than dozens, multiple dozens of isolated communities that are not connected to anybody's grid. In fact, they're hundreds of miles from anything that could even be considered a grid. So how do they get their energy? They're, they're basically burning diesel to meet their electricity needs. And so what we're seeing come together are these energy solutions where you take a little bit of wind and perhaps a little bit of, 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 of hydro, marine hydrokinetic, you, you couple it with, with battery and some storage, and, and we're finding some solutions. And it's innovative. In fact, it's so innovative, we've got a hearing scheduled um, over the President's Day recess up in Alaska, in Bethel, to, to bring members up so they can see what we're doing when it comes to energy innovation. And, and coupling things together to make them work, because we're never going to be part of a big energy grid in many parts of our state. We've got some, some great successes. Kodiak, uh, <clears throat> the huge fishing port, now produces 99.7% of its electricity from renewables. So they, they have wind, they have hydro, they've got a storage system that has just allowed it to work. But think about it. This is a major fishing port, 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 which during the summer needs a lot of energy when you're processing the fish. During the winter months, you've just got the local people there and you don't have as high energy needs. So how you even this out, how you, how you make, it, make it meet during the highs and the lows, this is what Kodiak has done. And they've taken themselves as a community that was once 100% dependent on diesel for their fuel, for their energy needs, to being 99.7% on, on renewables. One of the best provisions in the bill to help address energy costs is a modification of, uh, that we make within DOE's loan guarantee program. Instead of only allowing major corporations to apply, what we do is we allow states with energy financing institutions to seek funding and allow them to advance a range of energy projects. So just to kind of give a little context here, if the bill becomes law, the state of Alaska would be able to apply for a loan guarantee and then use those funds to help rural communities finance 
um, small hydropower projects, geothermal wells, um, MHK, uh, marine hydrokinetic technologies, and, and these hybrid microgrids that I'm talking about. So instead of kind of these top-down, uh, government-driven programs, what, what you would see is the state DOE programs and other elements um, contained within this Energy Policy Modernization Act really leveraging the innovation of the local people, leveraging the innovation of Alaskans, the American people, and the private sector to improve our energy landscapes. Mr. President, these are just a few of the ways that this Energy Policy Modernization Act will help Alaskans. It will help us produce more energy, it will help us save energy, and it will reduce local energy costs. And in the process, the extra gain and benefit is we create new jobs, we generate new revenues, we pri provide other economic benefits that we sorely need right now. And I've talked about Alaska and the impacts to my state as a result of modernizing our energy policies. But know that as Alaska benefits, other states benefit as well. Many of the provisions that I've mentioned in this, in this, uh, in my comments this, this afternoon are just as applicable to Louisiana or to Maine or Arizona or Montana as they are in my state. This bill fairly will bring economic benefits to, to every state. And as it brings economic benefits, the energy security that stems from the economic security that leads to the national security makes us all stronger. Yet another reason why I encourage the Senate to, to work with us, work with Senator Cantwell and I over these next couple days to move forward this broad bipartisan effort to modernize our nation's energy policies. Mr. President, I know that we have members who are, are anxious to speak this afternoon. Again, I will uh, make the same request that I made earlier, that if members uh, are interested in submitting any amendments to the Energy Policy Modernization Act, uh, now is the time, because we are going to be moving and, and hopefully moving quickly so we can proceed uh, with some expediency and, and efficiency throughout this week. With that, Mr. President, I yield the floor.